So maybe we could uh, kill the music? Yeah. All right, uh, folks, so ladies and gentlemen, if you grab uh, your seats and we could uh, reconvene. So our next uh, presenter, oh, oh, there she is. So uh, she couldn't uh, be here in person. So uh, we'll introduce uh, Michelle Boileau uh, as our next uh, guest, Mayor of Timmins. Uh, Mayor Bulo was born and raised in Timmins and has immense pride in our Northern community. As a Franco-Ontarian, she is happy to live in a city where Francophone heritage is still vibrant and celebrated. Uh, Mayor Bulo has more than a decade of experience working in a post-secondary education center Elected to the Municipal Council in the City of Timmins in 2018, Mier Boileau serves on several community boards and committees. She is also the chair uh, of the Northern Ontario Service Deliveries Association, as well as the Francais de Municipalité de l'Ontario. So please welcome Mier Boileau. Well, thank you for that introduction, Sam. I hope everyone can hear me okay. I'll try to uh, speak loudly. For those who don't know, Sam is not just a Timmins resident, but he's actually from South Porcupine. And myself being married to a man from South Porcupine, I always say you can take the boy out of Sopo, but you can never take Sopo out of the boy. There's a certain pride there. So I know that Sam is representing our area well there with you all today. Fortunately, as was mentioned, I couldn't get through when I was traveling last night. So this morning, I'm joining you from Timmins, situated on the traditional territories of the Metagmi, Metachuan, and Flying Post First Nations. Et d'abord, j'aimerais remercier Workplace Safety North de m'avoir invité à vous adresser ce matin et de m'avoir accommodé avec cette option de vous joindre virtuellement. C'est grandement, grandement apprécié. And being asked to join industry leaders and professionals to network and share knowledge about assessing risks and managing hazards associated with battery powered equipment was something that was different for me and I was very intrigued to intend, attend. So I do regret not being able to be there with you in person, but I know that Timmins is well represented in the room and my colleague, Jeremy Loma from the Timmins uh, Economic Development Corporation would be happy to talk to you uh, and answer any questions that you may have about the current projects and opportunities in Timmins. I know you're there, Jeremy, because I saw you uh, on screen during the networking break. So you could uh, go to find Jeremy afterwards. I know rem my remarks will certainly echo some of the comments already being made here this morning. Uh, I've, I've already heard some of the themes that I'll be touching on and I see through the agenda that there are a few, a few more things coming up. Um, however, I, I really do feel that repetition reinforces and underscores the importance of safety in mining, which is recognized as a key pillar, core competency, and competitive advantage in this industry. And you may be wondering, what does Michel Boileau know about the mining industry? Well, being born and raised in Timmins, there's an osmosis process that happens just kind of by nature. And uh, I also have a background in post-secondary education and skilled trades training, as well as employment services and economic development across Northeastern Ontario. So this is definitely something that I had to take a uh, particular, particular interest in throughout my career. Also, as a millennial, I am also by nature a little bit of a granola, a bit of a tree hugger. And since being elected in my current role, I've been asked time and time again how I'm able to reconcile my environmental values with being the mayor of a mining town. Well, I've been following with great interest how the mining industry is pivoting and adopting low emitting and zero emission technologies like battery electric vehicles, BVs. There are now many examples of this occurring throughout all of Northern Ontario, including here in Timmins, where existing mines are in the process of evaluating the benefits and opportunities of these new and innovative technologies and integrating them into their operations. One example I'm sure you're all familiar with is Newmont's Ford and Gold Mine in Chapleau, Ontario, which was recognized as one of the first all electric underground mines in Canada. You've just heard from Anikui Gold, or formerly known as Kirsten Lake Gold's uh, about their Macassa mine, which was an early user of underground BVs. And I know in Sudbury that these technologies are key in unlocking opportunities like the Glencore on a Ping Depth project. Not only are existing mines considering these technologies, but I'm also so pleased to see that junior exploration companies with advanced development projects 
are also seeking to leverage the benefits of these innovations and integrate them in mine planning and operations to establish the mines of the future. We know some of the underlining benefits of BEVs include improved working environments that are safer and promote operator health with better air quality, less noise pollution, reduction in vibration, lower temperatures underground. Overall, this can lead to less physical, mental and health related stressors, saving financial costs for the employer by protecting their employees. And as the wife of a skilled trades person and the mayor of a city full of miners, I personally appreciate the importance of ensuring safe and healthy work environments. This improved working environment also supports labor attraction and retention, which is something I know a little bit about through my previous career. And this bolsters the allure of working with new and innovative technologies. This is an important consideration since I hear from industrial partners almost daily about their current and anticipated local uh, labor needs, my apologies. And so impl implementing these new technologies can offer any company a really competitive advantage. And finally, the benefit of BEVs and mining that sits best with, again, my tree hugging heart, is the reduction in CO2 emissions, which supports sustainability, aligns with government regulations and targets, and also assists in building a social license. Although these benefits are very promising, the technology is still new, and they come with valid risks, which is why these types of symposiums exist. It's therefore important to undertake significant planning to identify, highlight, define, and assess potential risks, their likelihood of occurring, and to be proactive in developing appropriate mitigation strategies and taking preventative actions. These major changes are forcing all of you and industry players to adapt by reevaluating operations and revising health and safety related policies and procedures. And as we heard during the previous presentation, these necessary changes are not only at the company level. Looking at an overall bigger picture, emergency response services need to be prepared on how to evacuate mine sites in case of a BV related emergency, on how to extinguish the fire, how to treat the potential burns and interaction with chemicals. So this means that we also need to engage with post-secondary and training institutions to help keep curriculum current. More extensive training is necessary to deal with these instances as they're very different than traditional issues. We'll be hearing more about this in the following presentation, but things like the right of way underground with the movement of quiet machines will impact policies, procedures, and training for the movement of employees and equipment underground. There's also a need for knowledge, skills, and abilities to operate and maintain equipment and infrastructure. And in today's market, the availability of training programs and modules and educational offerings to upskill the labor force, they're still limited. So as I mentioned, the gaps in the labor force are being felt in every industry across the province, making the change potentially more difficult. But I know that we are all up for the challenge. It's inspiring to see the engagement at the symposium and to learn how the industry is moving forward progressively. I really do wish I could have been networking with you all during the break. I saw the screen. I was enjoying the jazz music from over here. I wish I could have been part of those conversations. I'll be sure to make the next one. Because this industry's culture of collaboration and knowledge sharing to overcome technological risks and, and improve safety is transformational and should serve as a positive example to other industries. I look forward to learning more and seeing the adoption of these new and innovative technologies throughout Northern Ontario, especially as we strive to establish a net zero industrial cluster here in the city of Timmins and surrounding areas. Je vous remercie de votre attention et je vous félicite pour votre leadership dans ce domaine. Congratulations to you all for your leadership in this field. Miigwech. And I'm happy to take questions if there's that capability through this virtual uh, uh, means. Um, but as I said, Jeremy, my colleague, would be happy to tell you a bit about what we're doing at the economic development level and in terms of working with our industrial partners on these kind of innovative uh, advancements. Merci encore. Thank you. Thank you. Uh... Mayor Boileau, uh, any questions for the mayor? None, any online? None, all right. 
We can put the Jeremy on the spot. He's up for it. He's up for it. It's all good. So we already had the uh, introductions uh, with Jamie and uh, myself just for uh, future endeavors uh, in SOPO. <laughs> so thank you very much, uh, Mayor Boileau, for your participation. My pleasure. Thank you again for inviting me. All right, thank you for that. So uh, just uh, moving forward, our next presenter. So is uh, David Lyon. So David is an experienced Canadian mechanical engineer who specializes in the development of mobile equipment technologies in, for mining. So in 2019, he founded Zero Nexus to focus on battery electrical vehicle technologies in hard to electrify industries. So David advocates for the electrification of the mining industry to achieve a decarbonized future. He views this not just as a technological change, but as a means to transform workplaces and contribute to global decarbonization. As a founder of Zero Nexus, David collaborates with mineral producers, startups, and original equipment manufacturers in adopting uh, battery electric vehicles. His company is recognized uh, for its commitment to sustainable mining practices and driving the shift towards a more sustainable industrial future. So please welcome uh, David. Thanks for the nice introduction. Uh, let's see if we can get this going. Okay. So, um, yeah, thank you very much for inviting me, uh, WSN, and hosting this event. Um, I've, we've participated in the past, actually, last year we were at this event. Not myself, one of my colleagues came. But um, I think I'm just going to jump right in. Um, and I'm going to start with uh, some statistics. <clears throat> so this is a report from McKinsey. Uh, it's actually from February of 2023. And basically uh, what it's saying is that, you know, mining isn't an attractive industry uh, to the youth. Um, and I, I think that's a, a real shame, you know, spending my whole, whole career in mining. Um, I, I can't think of a better industry in Canada specifically where you get exposure to such a broad um, spectrum of problems and not just that um, you know if you're if you're in the automotive sector you may be pigeonholed and being an engineer you'd be pigeonholed into a you know bolted connection or something but in mining um, and from the OEM perspective sometimes you're in a team of you know like half a dozen people and you're designing an entire powertrain and that's um, some of the exposure that 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 I've had um, not just that, um, mining can be really an adventurous uh, an exciting uh, industry to be in. Um, you know, you travel all over the world, you can end up in Australia, Peru, Thompson, Manitoba. <laughs> no, hey, I, I brought up Thompson for a specific reason about a decade ago. Uh, before starting Zero Nexus, um, I was working for an OEM. I was there and I was meeting with uh, a mobile maintenance engineer at uh, Valley Operations. And I came out uh, out of the door and I saw a bunch of guys from two companies, Meditech Engineering and McLean Engineering. And they're waiting to go see this mobile maintenance guy. And um, I thought, oh, what are they doing here? I, I want to inquire. And they sort of gave me a bit of an introduction of, well, there's a ventilation issue here and they're exploring alternatives. So, and that alternative was battery electric vehicles. So uh, good thing that Thompson is, you know, a smaller community. I made the assumption that they were staying at the same hotel as me. And right next to the hotel was a Boston pizza. And I figured that's the only place in town. So 
right after talking about BEVs with them, I went and hung out at the Boston Pizza for pretty much the whole day waiting for them to show up. <laughs> and I cornered them and that sort of started my journey actually uh, on battery electric vehicles because before long I was joining that group and, and being a part of the, the development of BEVs. Uh, around that time, um, I made this little blog post on LinkedIn, why the minds of the future will be diesel free. Uh, note that the, the timestamp there is 2016. And I think I say in the article that within two to five years, uh, you know, all the talk will be about PEVs. Um, so we're in 2014 now. Um, I'd say, yeah, there's been a major upkeep, but maybe not, you know, the optimistic David of 2016's uh, prediction. So, um, you know, taking on this this uh, this research group Zero Nexus, I thought, well, I don't like being wrong, um, and what could be holding back that adoption? I didn't think it was the technology. So, um, and here's just a little picture of how many. And this is a sort of public record and the numbers aren't perfect, but it's it's meant to inspire that yeah we are down the road. Um, we're picking up a, a lot more traction a lot more fleets being bought this number doesn't encompass all of the BEVs. it's missing a lot of uh, utility equipment, but the major equipment movers and a lot of this equipment isn't actually in operation yet, but. Um, as far as worldwide supply, I think Canada is really the leader, um, by far the leader in, in the adoption, but still there's a long way to go. So uh, my colleague, Alexa Marco, she came to this event last year and uh, during her, her uh, chat, she put a little thing called a Slido on the board and, and took a poll of the audience, might be a lot of the same people just to get a gauge of what exactly is holding back the adoption of BEVs and sort of the consensus and the way these on the little computer there, the way these um, this word art works as you know, the, the most prevalent answer ends up being the biggest word. So it sort of identified that regulation, legislation, training and education were the biggest opportunities to, to accelerate uh, the technology and in industry. So um, since that time, um, we, uh, we got some research funding and we wanted to explore, um, oh, sorry, we wanted to explore what that would look like. What is the actual gap in the specialized training? Um, so um, basically, uh, we had to set an hypothesis and that hypothesis was that there actually is in fact a gap in specialized training needed um, for today's mining workforce. And, and then we went about quantifying um, what, what that cap could be. So first off, we needed to figure out what are the kind of categories of, of training needs. So um, firstly, there's just general BEV safety um, we wanted to understand a little bit more about charging and maintenance safety, job planning, and then just general awareness. And uh, so these are the categories that um, we set aside as the areas that we wanted to find out more. Um, and then on top of that, we actually, uh, we also explored, um, we made some segments in that. So the, the training needed for an operator you know, you would suspect is different than from the electricians or mine management and, and beyond. So we needed to segment all that information. And, and then we went about, um, so now this is a qualitative uh, research project. So it's, again, it's not about the technology. It's, uh, it was an anonymous, um, uh, so basically we conducted 100 plus interviews um, and that, that included some workshops. So we, we ran two uh, short courses at the two different CIM events, CIM National, CIM MIMO. So there's about a kind of a giving element there. We were also doing some training uh, whilst putting the sticky notes on the board, um, trying to understand everyone's needs. 
um, but we also did get to site. Um, so um, what's what's different between you know the the workshop and the site is uh, well, I, I guess I should say um, you know we were going there with the intent and asking for people's problems. So you can imagine um, what kind of list we were getting. <laughs> Um, and I, bet, I guess this sort of speaks to uh, Norm's comment earlier as well, is we were, we're really looking for uh, information, both good and bad, um, to help us uh, assess the, the needs. So just sort of anecdotal evidence, um, here's a couple of the takeaways, or these are things that people are saying, and this may sound um, like the everyman, um, it may even sound like you, because some of you in the, in the room have participated in this. But uh, one of the things that we kept hearing was that we'd like to learn more about battery chemistry. Uh, I put in brackets, unbiased, and the full life cycle analysis of battery electric vehicles. So, um, and this came mostly from the participants at our short courses. They said, we came to this course because we wanted a third party to tell us about the differences in, in battery technology. Um, as, as an additional party to what we're learning from the OEMs. The other thing um, that we heard a lot was that they're look, people are looking for more applications than case studies as BVs grow in popularity. So that luckily now there's, you know, fleets are about to go into operation. So there should, should be a lot of opportunity for learning um, uh, at this critical junction. And a big one um, was that there's no rule of thumb, there's no playbook that exists right now in the industry for how to operate machines as a fleet. So I think that's a, a really big opportunity again uh, right now. So now let's get into the into the results. And this is just one of the groups. So we, we uh, segmented the results into three groups, uh, mine maintenance, operations and planning, um, and the third group was, uh, uh, oh, mine management, sorry. And so, um, and I'm only gonna show one of these, but what we use as a methodology is called the value proposition canvas. Essentially what that does is it, it takes all of that information and interviews, you know, <laughs> reams and reams of paper and, and notes and things, and it tries to boil down three things for each individual. Uh, the jobs they do, uh, the pains that they experience, and what are some things that could be a gain to them. And then uh, across the table, what you're supposed to do, so top to bottom, is identify what kind of, in this case it says products or services, but we're most interested in training. Identify the training product and service that would support their job, and then the pains that would relieve, you know, what, what kind of uh, information in the training would relieve a pain, same with the gain creators. So um, pretty small, even I'm having trouble reading that, but anyway, um, let's see if I can focus in here. So uh, like I said, this is one, one group, mine maintenance, and uh, I, I guess, one glaring obvious thing, you know, especially since this is all condensed on a, on a page, is there are a lot more things in the pain column. That's not meant to point out that, you know, BVs are a pain. Remember, we went in saying, what are your problems? Um, so I think if we structured this, uh, this research a bit differently, and again, uh, we maybe wouldn't put so much emphasis on what are the pains. So just an example how this works and how this information is useful, and I think we'll, this information will be available, publicly available to everyone here and, and beyond, because we're actually put, putting this into a white paper. Um, okay. But um, so as an example, uh, one of the things that we're hearing is the first 500 hours downtime also due to waiting for parts. So how could training help with that? Now, to be fair to the, the, the OEMs, this is a new technology. What are the failure modes? You know, those are things that are being learned. But on the training side, there is a, a, 
a, like an understanding of what regular maintenance should be and that should be part of the planning for the mine maintenance group and we felt like that's something that should be implemented in a mine maintenance training program um, one of the other things that was identified on the gain side was well first of all uh, on the mine maintenance side these these are people that are very busy they don't have extra spare time so um, really what they were saying was how much time do we need to give up to learn about the technology so uh, from a gain creator side are there pieces of mine maintenance training that could be done through an on-demand on platform but thinking about this a little bit more globally uh, since I don't have the slides for the other two groups. Um, here are some of our, our conclusions or takeaways. Um, and the first one is that there is exist a gap in addressing the planning stages for BEVs. And by planning stages, I mean everyone who isn't an operator essentially. So, and I think actually that gap exists globally. Um, just people understanding the nuances of the technology or the terminology, that's very important. Um, from the operator's side, uh, it felt like training may not be as critical. Not, and when I say that, I mean book training or online training. And that the takeaway is the hands-on experience tends to be the, the most effective, address most of the challenges uh, more effectively than anything in a book. And on the mine maintenance side, there clearly is a steep learning curve. Um, we're learning every day from everything that we're, that's being brought back from site, but uh, it necessitates, necessitates a much more comp comprehensive training approach. So luckily, you know, um, that mine maintenance side and maybe even the development of BEVs, that's, here's a couple of the programs, you know, locally, you know, the Cambrian College and Northern College, Laurentian, they're taking on the torch of really building programs to support the maintenance side. But we still think that there's a gap on the other side, which is the, the mine, mine planning, fleet adoption, that, that sort of thing. So, um, so what do we do with this information? Well, there's that mine planning gap. And just our association with CIM and and uh, being able to deliver on those short courses, uh, CIM approached us to think about, and they have a new, I don't know how new it is actually, but there's something called the CIM Academy. So it's an online training platform. And they approached us to help with designing, developing some of those that um, planning, basic battery planning, but also eventually for the operational or the fleet management side uh, of planning. So this is just like a sneak peek of what they're developing. And I'd say it's a, a few months away because what's really important to us, and I think CIM, is that there's lots of industry engagement. Um, it needs to be industry driven, really, if it's going to be successful and, and, and fully adopted. And um, so not, not much to show there yet. We're, we're still in the early stages, so there's still opportunity for, for people to get involved. So um, I have a couple more slides. Um, not sure if this is working. Uh, start presenting to display the poll results. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure uh, if there's another button I need to push to bring up the, the, the slide question here. That's maybe my fault. Now, if you could run that somehow, I'm not sure. Yeah, okay, it's fine. I'll I'll do a a uh, paper poll here, but the the intent here is, as a research organization, um, really we're taking uh, this opportunity now to investigate um, what is, you know, we've already been to the sites, we've already collected the initial data, the 100 interviews, but now what we're asking is, if the industry had a, a body that 
could actually go into these sites and collect data at the different mines and then and, and these fleets that are running what would you like to learn so next steps for us and I'll run a little video here in a second is really to extend this research into the fleet adoption um, uh, exercise get the sites uh, get in boots on the ground and understanding the the, the inter the system level engineering that's occurring and adopting these these systems and the output needs to be in, in an awareness campaign and what we'd really like is um, for uh, you know to thank everyone who's given us the information and the access so far but to help us continue this so uh, if you could run the video Getting production ready for new battery electric vehicles takes time, experience, and proper planning. To avoid months of teething pains and lost productivity, companies need to be more effective at transferring knowledge and experience throughout their organization. Through in-depth conversations with companies leading BEV adoption, we've come to identify many of the challenges teams have had to overcome and the strategies they are deploying slash employing to succeed in this new electrified landscape. We need your help to dig deeper. We want to know how these problems apply to your unique situation and how other teams' successes can help your company maintain productivity and create a safer working environment. Capturing the perspectives of the people working closest with BEVs will help create the most insight on what works and what doesn't. Our team is looking to have frank conversations with BEV machine operators, shift managers, and mine planners. Zero Nexus is invested in bridging the knowledge gap in BEV deployment, and we're committed to helping our clients eliminate the unknowns around BEV adoption. We are gathering experiences to help find common ground across the industry, to create a collective base of knowledge on best practice for operationalizing BEVs. Contact us today at www.zero.nexus to have your say and become a keystone in driving BEV innovation forward. Getting per Thank you. Um, so yeah, this is, it's kind of a call to action invitation to participate and there's a lot of ways that you can participate. Um, so we're, we're already moving ahead with this research. Um, we've had um, excellent engagement with some of the OEMs and even better engagement from some of the major mining companies. Um, but yeah, I, I'd love, I'd love to continue this research. I'd really like to say thank you to NRC IRAP for um, giving us the resources and the opportunity to do this research. And the other important group that there's two groups I'd like to thank uh, both EpiRock and McLean Engineering uh, for generously contributing some of the video footage, but also giving us access to some additional information. It's really starting to build the, this training content, this industry-driven training content for CIM. And I, you know, I hope that the other OEMs, I know I haven't reached out to all the other OEMs, so fair to them, this might be the first time they're hearing about it. Please reach out to me, reach out to our group. Uh, we'd love to involve you in, in this exercise as well. And uh, yeah, I think there's there's certainly more opportunity to get to, to more sites and, and add to this research. So thank you very much for your time and I appreciate, uh, <laughs> I appreciate your time. I already said that, okay. <laughs> Uh, thanks, David. So any questions on the floor for David? Gabby, any online? None? All right. So, um, so you talked about uh, the white paper. Mm -hmm. uh, so when do you see that coming out for the group or you need? Yeah, so we've, we actually have, uh, we're submitting it um, next week, I think. Um, and then I think it'll be public within a month, something like that. Okay, perfect. Okay, uh, go ahead. 
Dave. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I'm just wondering, uh, maybe you could comment on, I know you and I have both been around the mining industry, working for OEMs for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, I found that with EV adoption, there's a, a greater willingness with OEMs and mining companies to to play nice with one another. To put, are you finding that with your uh, interaction and, and? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's explicit in in what I was showing there, but um, like the term interoperability gets floated around a lot. That's something um, that I think actually you mentioned in your presentation about. Uh, whether if everyone had a different fuel nozzle, how, how difficult that would be to run a mine. So, yeah, I think on on that level, yeah, there's a lot more willingness to share. Um, and, you know, since engaging in this activity and building out a steering committee and, um, yeah, it seems like everyone is aligned in what where the industry is headed. And so since there's an alignment from both from the, the, the mining companies, well, I feel like the, the OEMs are doing a great job in sort of coming together at the same table and, and sharing information. So yeah, there are differences. And I, I think the, the OEMs have differences in opinions on how the technology should be, fair enough. Uh, and there is limited regulation on how it actually has to be built. Um, but yeah, I think, a lot of those ideas are converging now that more equipment is getting in the field and we're getting better results in, in certain directions. So uh, yeah, I, I guess overall, and this this symposium sort of testament to that, look how many people are, are here and, and the types of sharing that we're getting um, uh, from, you know, like Nico Eagle and yourself, I think that is an indicator that, yeah, people are sharing more and there's a more willingness to share. Thanks. Any other questions, Hartsuk? Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Uh, thanks, David. That was a very good presentation. I understood from the initial uh, data you showed that there is a reluctance for people to come to work in the mining industry, as you were showing at the top. So, and as I see it with the BEVs, electrical, and also autonomous, the future will rely greatly on the electricians, mechanics, skill, and automation, you know, technicians, so instrumentation. How do we address this challenge? Because we face that as well, see, in the ministry, attracting the electrical people, especially electricians, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm sure the mining companies also have similar challenge. So how do we deal with that? Can you comment on that? I'll try to comment on that. I mean, I guess I was trying to say, and, and maybe it's just a marketing activity by the mining industry. That's something I can't influence. But I, I can personally say that, you know, the opportunity in mining uh, is, you know, a lot of those other industries, it's much greater. There's much greater opportunity to solve problems. But I think in that paper specifically, I think it calls out um, some different ways of hiring. and like I think what they're trying to convey is maybe higher for skill sets. I mean, my background is mechanical engineering. I spent four years as a, as a service engineer, as a, a mechanic essentially. Um, and maybe I didn't have the, the red seal ticket or whatever, but I did have the understanding of the technology. So maybe there are ways to collect different people from different um, backgrounds as long as they understand and see the the opportunity that mining presents. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, um, and maybe this in Sudbury is an exception, but I think also that paper spells out um, like a significant decrease in the availability of spaces or education. I think they call out Australia specifically, where you know mining related engineering. Um, engineering uh, schools, they're, you know, they're going away. They're kind of the way of the dodo birds. So um, it's to get in front of, you know, more traditional mechanical electrical engineers or these programs and introduce mining to them uh, early on. I certainly, 
Uh, I don't come from a mining background uh, and I didn't go to a mining school myself, but, and I also didn't envision myself working in mining, but I'm so glad that I landed where I did. So I'm not sure I answered that question very well, but. Okay, no, thanks. Is there uh, anyone else? Any other questions from the floor? No. Okay. Uh, nothing online. Thank you, David, for your presentation. Okay, so uh, we'll wait uh, for Paul, the, so the mayor of Sudbury, uh, to come forward uh, uh, shortly. Uh, so for those of you not familiar with WSN, I want to let you know that Workplace Safety North is a non-for-profit uh, organization and one of four sector-based health and safety associations in Ontario. As the only health and safety association headquartered in Northern Ontario, WSN is responsible for providing province-wide government-approved workplace health and safety training and services for the mining and forest products in this industries. WSN also administers the Provincial Mines Rescue Program. With health and safety specialists and mine rescue officers located right across the province, WSN and its legacy organizations have been helping make Ontario workplaces safer for more than 100 years. More recently, uh, WSN has facilitated groundbreaking research into the mining industry's top risks and their root, cause, root causes, and that included battery electric vehicles. I want to take a moment to thank all the industry uh, research participants, which included subject matter experts from both labor and management. Uh, by volunteering your time and expertise, you have helped make Ontario mining workplaces safer. Uh, thank you for so much for your dedication. Uh, the WSN Mining Advisory Committee is also made up of industry volunteers. Uh, they are responsible for the event you're uh, at right now. About five years ago, they asked WSN to host an event focused on BEV safety. And here we are now at the fourth symposium. Thanks again so much to our industry volunteers who dedicate their time to making mining workplaces safer. Your thoughts are much appreciated. So uh, I thought uh, Ted Hanley was uh, in the room, so he's not uh, in. So. Um, just maybe a uh, norm, um, just gonna, uh, just any updates on just the mine rescue, uh, TAC committee and if you want to share with, uh, with the group. Yeah. Pardon me? <clears throat> so yes, I, I mentioned during my presentation that I'm on the TAC committee. Uh, we met, uh, in January, I think it was 15th or 16th. And uh, topics such as BEV equipment has come up. Um, uh, new programs that are being implemented, new gear that's being sought. It's a very active committee made up of every region in Ontario. Probably have 20 members, I would say, uh, including my rescue officers. So very, very active group. Um, <clears throat> pretty much any topic that comes up on a mine rescue front, whether it's underground or surface, um, is a topic of discussion. As a rule, the, uh, how should I put it, each district will report on their activities, um, training, any fires that the teams have responded to, uh, any new technology that's being introduced. I know, Justin, you've been part of that. Anything else that I missed? Yeah, so 
as a simple example, I think it was the December one. We uh, we actually had it at Macasa. Um, I think it was December, and uh, we took the uh, the group underground uh, for a quick tour. Uh, we brought them over to the um, December nineteenth, two thousand twenty-two fire site that we had, just to show them exactly where the fire transpired and uh, the activities that Ontario Mine Rescue took. Um, we just acquired a brand new rescue truck um, that they were very pleased to see. Uh, what's nice about it, it fits on number four shaft cage or conveyance, so it can be parked on surface, brought any level underground where two, a four shaft goes and driven off and away we go. So it's those types of things that really enhance the uh, mine rescue effort in the province and I don't ask. Any questions? Thanks, uh, Norm, for that. Great. Um, <clears throat> so just the comment uh, that Norm made uh, earlier on, just dealing with uh, the fire departments. So last week, uh, I was infirm, uh, informed uh, that uh, you know we all have these transit buses in our municipalities and just a supplier in the near future that they're going to start stop building uh, diesel buses and moving towards uh, the battery electric so that's another component you know dealing with our you know fire departments in our municipalities so um, and then one of the discussions I had with Norm was, uh, you know, are the fire departments informed with these new purchases? You know, just dealing with uh, procurement and whatnot. And, you know, just um, in a couple of years, I believe there's a uh, number of buses already being ordered uh, that's coming into municipalities and just how that's going to be uh, transformed dealing with uh, you know these fires or potential fires and any off gassing or even charging stations so if you're if you're driving from uh, say timmins to sudbury so where do you charge up so is there something another place in between right so uh, again just uh, the length of time these batteries um, have in motion so just keeping those uh, perspectives just with uh, uh, the OEMs and uh, you know the, um, the battery manufacturers. So, uh, sure, we have our next uh, presenter. So, um, pleased to uh, introduce our next guest. Hey, so. Uh, Paul Lafive, so Mayor of Greater Sudbury. So Mayor Lafive was elected Mayor of Greater Sudbury on October 24th, 2022, and assumed office on November 15th, 2022. He also serves as a board member of the Greater Sudbury Development Corporation and the Greater Sudbury Police Services Board. Mayor Lafive was twice elected Member of Parliament for the riding of Sudbury, served from 2015 to 2021. During his time with the federal government, he sat on the public accounts and official languages committees before being appointed parliamentary secretary to the Ministry of Natural Resources. He was engaged and dedicated contributor to the Canadian Minerals and Metals Plan. In 2019, he represented Canada at the Energy and Environmental G20 Summit in Japan. So please welcome Mayor Lafayette. Thanks, Sam, and uh, thanks for uh, keeping the uh, podium warm as you were <laughs> waiting for my arrival, and I appreciate that. And if there's anybody from Cambrian here, and I'll see my friends from Cambrian and others, Steve, I'm Ill illegally parked in your parking lot, so if I do get a bill, just tell Sean Poland that it's coming to him. All right? Just make sure about that. Um, great to be here this morning, or almost afternoon, and I apologize that I'm the one uh, between you and your lunch. Um, and I know that George will be here, unfortunately, virtually. Would love to, would have liked to uh, certainly 
have a chat with him, and I know that Michelle Boileau, well, Mayor of uh, Timmins, spoke as well. And so that just goes to show in Northern Ontario the importance of mining, that the mayors are, more, they want to be here, they want to speak to you guys, and certainly speak to whoever is there virtually as well about the great stuff that's going on here and how proud we are of this industry, but at the same time, how do we make sure that our, all of our workers come back home safe? And in Sudbury, that's who we are. Safety is number one. That is our people. People are number one. So again, thank you for uh, having me here today. And uh, certainly thank you to Workplace Safety North for organizing this very timely and important discussion. And to all presenters for sharing your expertise um, and thanks, uh, Sam, for the introduction, um, and basically, as well, Cambrian for hosting this. This is a great venue, and all the stuff that the great stuff that's going on here at uh, Cambrian College in respect to safety and certainly EV vehicles as well. On behalf of Council, and I'm sure you've, uh, you've heard from Mike Parent, and I'm very lucky that he is a councillor with me at City Council of Sudbury, and I'm not the only voice promoting mining uh, in Sudbury, Northern Ontario. Canada. And so, Mike, thank you so much for all of your support when it comes to uh, the mining sector and everything you, that you do at, at City Council. And I really want to, to uh, have a warm welcome. I know it's snowing. We need snow around here. Anybody who enjoys winter like I do, we want to go snowmobiling. It's been an awful season. So the snow is there. Unfortunately, that means a few of you, can, of your colleagues couldn't make it. Um, but uh, so thank you for taking the time and coming here to have uh, traveled to Greater Sudbury for this very important symposium. And uh, I know there's folks from around the world that, that, that are watching. Donc, au nom du conseil, merci beaucoup uh, d'être ici avec nous. As Mayor of Greater Sudbury, I'm really committed to supporting in, in, uh, our greener and healthier future for the mining industry. We are, as you know, the world's largest integrated mining industrial complex in the world, with nine operating mines, two mills, two smelters, a nickel refinery, and over 300 mining supply and service companies, all within our municipal boundaries. As in, you heard in my introduction, my old job as a parliamentary secretary to natural resources, obviously the mining sector was, 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 was given to me. The minister was always busy with oil and gas. <laughs> and so, but I met with some of my colleagues from other countries and oh, you're gonna meet with the, uh, the junior minister from, from Sweden. Sweden's a mining powerhouse, true. Started to chat with the folks from Sweden. They got 10 mines in the whole country. In the whole country, which is great. Don't want to take anything away from them. But think about that. We have nine mines within the city boundaries of Sudbury alone. When you really reflect upon that, say, wow, what an opportunity. And are we doing everything that we can, certainly on the processing side and the extraction side and everything added value that we can do there? And so, as Mayor of Sudbury now, I'd like to tell that story of saying we are very fortunate to have the endowment of certainly the riches that we have in our, our feet, but how do we make sure that we extract it safely in a basically the best environmentally way that we can do and uh, how to make sure that our folks come back home. Um, much progress has been made to improve safety measures in the industry and everyone in this room understands that continuous efforts are necessary to ensure the well-being of our miners especially with the introduction of new equipment and technologies underground. That is why it is so encouraging to see representatives from mining companies, research institutions, occupational health and safety organizations, and others coming together today with a shared goal of ensuring that every worker returns home at the end of their shift. La amélioration conduite de la santé et de la sécurité dans l'industrie minière est une priorité pour notre communauté et pour l'industrie. Et merci de faire ça votre priorité. As the world moves increasingly towards net zero and low carbon industries, greater electrification of vehicles and more digital and innovative technologies, greater Sudbury can help. We have the land, the talent and the resources. And so we are without question, the sustainable and responsible leader in critical minerals, minerals extraction of the world. The world looks at us to raise the bar and we are, and we gotta keep pushing that bar as well. While Greater Sudbury is already known globally as a hub for mine exploration, extraction, and processing, our region is now connecting all parts of the critical mineral supply chain. This includes the important work of recycling and reclaiming mine waste, as well as value-added manufacturing. This new BV technology is being built and tested right here in Sudbury. And it's what we do here, and as you've already heard from Anthony at, from team at McLean, this new equipment and infrastructure is being integrated in mines, not only in Northern Ontario, but around the world as we'll hear after 
the lunch. So ongoing research to improve the efficiency and the safety of underground BV technologies is happening right here. Recall in my old job, I actually went to the board in mine and uh, it was a bolter done by, by actually by McLean. I was talking to the guys on the bolter and saying, actually, we don't even know if it's on or off. That's, they said, that's pretty scary for them. We don't even know what's on or off. And this was probably five years ago now with the first you know, electric, uh, all electric vehicles uh, the, the, that are there. And um, it was wild because I was bringing in and a bunch of people from uh, Anarchan, Natural Resources Canada, uh, saying, well, actually, that jumbo was, was built by Sandvik and Sudbury, and that bolter was built by McLean's and Sudbury, and all the equipment was, was being built in northern Ontario. They were just shocked. They were, big folks from down south don't think that, that we do that here, but at the same time, the safety aspect of it is also has to be de-risked here at the same time. And that's why we never have that chance to talk about it and to showcase that it's key. And that's why the Cambrian Center for Smart Mining is very important that to connect all those dots to make it come together. And later today, I know you'll have the opportunity to tour the electric vehicle lab here. And it's part of the Center for Smart Mining here at Cambrian and learn more about how applied research contributes to safer, healthier products and work environments. This is yet another way the greater Sudbury ecosystem continues to spur innovation in the mining industry. En ce qui concerne l'industrie minière dans le Grand Sudbury, je crois fermement qu'il faut regarder vers l'avant et planifier l'avenir. Nous avons, il faut rester ouvert aux nouvelles idées, et aux nouvelles preuves, une nouvelle façon de faire dans cette industrie. So once again, thank you to Workplace Safety North and my colleague Councillor Parent, as I said, for spearheading the symposium and for continuing the important tradition of making workplaces safer since 1915. Enjoy, I hope you enjoy the conference. I hope you enjoy the snow. And I'll probably see you at PDEC as well. Have a great day, everyone. Merci beaucoup. Any questions for Paul before he sits uh, down? Mayor Lafayette? Soon, soon, yeah. Perfect. Thank, thank you very much again. So, so just before we uh, uh, break for lunch, so it just brought to my attention, I just want to recognize Jody Young. She's uh, president and CEO from WS, WSPS. There you go. So I believe, so uh, Jody, I don't know if you want to make any comments. Uh, just, I'll give you, a, I'll bring you the microphone there. So good morning, everyone. Um, I'm from Workplace Safety and Prevention Services, the sister organization to WSN who focus on manufacturing, service and retail, and the ag sector. So um, myself and my colleague Angela are here today uh, with excitement. We're in the process of putting together a uh, white paper for um, dealing with the hazards of batteries from the electric vehicle industry uh, through the supply chain. <clears throat> Excuse me. So looking at the hazards for auto recyclers, um, handlers of batteries, uh, disposal sites, etc. So um, there's a lot of unknowns. There's a lot of catch up to do with respect to regulation in this space, just like in the mining industry. And the stakeholders within our sectors uh, are many of them are small businesses predominantly. And so unlike the mining industry that is very um, very attuned to the concept of risk assessments within your industries the same isn't true for a lot of those small businesses that are dealing and handling very complex hazards that they're very unfamiliar with so we're really hoping to collaborate with wsn with the mining industry take the learnings um, that you have shared uh, today and and in many other forums and really uh, take and springboard some of those opportunities 
into those other industries that are really dealing with uh, a lot of tremendous risk. So thank you for letting us join and um, look forward to connecting with a lot of you here today. Thank you. All right, folks, uh, they'll bring us uh, to lunch. So uh, we could uh, reconvene at 12.30, I would believe. 12.45, sorry. 12.45 is our next uh, presenter. All right, so lunch is uh, provided. It's on uh, the side table to your left. So feel free to enjoy that 45 minutes or so. Thank you. <laughs>